Hello and welcome to the Beyond Biotech podcast and this is number 18. And today, October the 14th, is not only National Egg Day, it's Be Bald and Be Free Day. They may be connected and I'm not sure what the free part of that means, maybe free from hairbrushes and free from shampoo. I'm Jim Cornell from The Biotech, and yes, I am follically challenged, as they say, but not necessarily free. Well, I'm free to go for a coffee at Bio Europe if you're going, and if you want to meet up. We can do an interview or just talk about anything, sports, music, the weather. I have quite a few interviews already hooked up, but plenty of room for more. This will be my first Bio Europe, and I'm really looking forward to it, as long as the weather is decent there in Leipzig. I think it's rained so much in Scotland recently that I'm going to end up with a waterfront property. Thinking about that though, it might not be such a good idea because I'd have no way out of the village in the car. It was an odd week in many ways. I had a package delivered that I ordered in February that was given up as lost. I got a message from the school asking me to send in the form that was sent home with my child a day before they actually sent the form. And I also got asked if I wanted to do an interview with someone that I'd just interviewed the day before. So maybe rather than go into details about the strange week, it's best to just get going and tell you who's on the podcast. So this time we have four interviews and five guests, and they are Juho Jalkanen, COO of Farron Pharmaceuticals, Artemis Bogosian and Melania Regente from the EPFL School of Basic Sciences in Basel in Switzerland, Thomas Turner, CEO and co-founder of Cultivated Biosciences, and Joanna Magaji, conference manager for the Biotech X event. So let's get to the news that you may have missed over at labiotech.eu, and it was another busy seven days. A Saudi university study could pave the way for new cancer drugs, a Chinese company has had its diabetes drug approved, and Biocartis has started the European commercialization of its liver cancer test. A trial has started for the treatment of warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, JW Therapeutics received approval for its relapsed or refractory follicular lymphoma drug, and Nanoscope Therapeutics retinitis pigmentosa treatment received fast-track designation. Positive data indicate a likely therapeutic effect of an Alzheimer's drug. Clinical microbiomics is expanding after a 10 million euro investment, and Munitherapeutics received a 4.9 million dollar grant for Parkinson's disease research. We had our September roundup of the biggest private biotech investments. A license has been granted to Enterobiotics for the manufacture of microbiome product candidates, and Illumina and AstraZeneca are looking to drug target discovery with a collaborative pivotal research collaboration. Tilt Biotherapeutics dosed the first US patient in its ovarian cancer immunotherapy trial, Cambridge Cognition is acquiring eClinical Health, and Malaysian Genomics has signed a research agreement with the Malaysian government. We had an article on boosting farmers' falling productivity with AI in drug discovery, Boston Bioworks is helping precision fermentation startups to scale up, and skin microbiome research could lead to new approaches for addressing organ damage after stem cell transplants. A T-cell therapy platform trial has started for adults with blood cancers. Odyssey Therapeutics raised $168 million for its oncology medicine portfolio, and the CMT Research Foundation is funding Samsara Therapeutics' Charcot Marie II treatment A plan has been launched to improve the diversity of clinical trials, a new agreement is set to take advantage of stem cells from first teeth, and you can read all of these and a whole lot more at labiotech.eu, including all of the ones from today that I didn't even include in this roundup. So let's get to this week's interviews, and we're starting off with an interesting application for biotech, and that's with the military. Ferran Pharmaceuticals presented data from its preclinical study on treating wounds at the Military Health System Research Symposium in Orlando, Florida recently. To tell us what it all means and about the company is its COO, Yuho Yelkanen. 
I guess the first and most obvious question is if you could give me some background on the company. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a university spin out out of the University of Turku, established already 2006. But to give a bit more flavor, this goes way back. This is over 30 years of world leading research in immunology. So that's where our drugs come from. We play with the immune system, both, you know, trying to spark it up or then, you know, tune it down if there's too much ongoing. So that's what we're about. You've been quite busy of late, lots of press releases coming out. I think the first one was on Tramacan. Could you tell me about the development of that? Because it seems like quite an interesting drug. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorites. I'm, I'm a vascular surgeon by background and it has everything to do with vascular integrity. So here we're playing with the endothelial layer on the surface of blood vessels and it's actually an old drug repurposed. It's intravenous interferon beta. But the key thing is that we wish to induce CD73, which is the rate limiting enzyme producing anti inflammatory adenosine. It's actually widely respected in academia and literature that CD73 is the key enzyme for organ protection. And we just found the way to induce it, you know, in a safe, effective way. And the thing is, it's not interferon beta itself, it's CD73, the molecule we're targeting and inducing on the endothelium. And how is it administered? It has to be IV. This is the cool thing because, you know, interferon beta is an old drug used sub-Q or intramuscular for uh, multiple sclerosis. It was even trialed sub-Q for COVID because it's a good an antiviral drug as well. But the thing is here, the drug has to go directly to the endothelium, so it has to be IV, sub-Q or intramuscular administration will not uh, hit the endothelium to the extent we need it to happen. I guess there was some interest in this from military installations. Can you tell me why that is? Yeah, yeah. Happened to be a bit of a military man myself and, and being a vascular surgeon, uh, there's actually huge unmet need in this patient population we as pharma do not usually think of, and that's the modern warfighter and major trauma in itself, all for the civilian population. So when you get a major wound, for example, to a limb or major hemorrhage, you have to shut down an artery, for example, place a tourniquet. That's like putting a belt on your leg so that you won't, you don't bleed out. So ischemia, shutting down the blood circulation is what the immediate rescue is, but then, for example, a limb can only take up to six hours of that ischemia, and then they need to get to the hospital, they need to get a checkup, can the limb be salvaged, does it need to be amputated, this is a bit harsh, but this is reality, and a huge unmet need for limb saving. We knew the drug is good for ischemia and reperfusion, so when you uh, done your surgery, you release the blood flow, there's a systemic inflammation that happens when you restore the blood flow, and this is where the drug comes in. So it's highly protective of organs, muscle, in ischemia, but also in the reperfusion phase when systemic inflammation hits. So in this study we just released and did with the DOD and the U.S. Air Force, we gave traumakine at the moment you place the tourniquet. So when you shut down the circulation from a limp and we give six hours of ischemia to the limp. And usually these were now primates and we did their upper limb, so the arm. And usually the arm is basically dead after six hours of ischemia. But what the trial showed was that when you gave traumakine at the moment when shutting down the circulation, the arms of the primates were completely healthy. They used them normally afterwards. Wound healing was good. And there was basically no muscle atrophy and so forth, which you usually see after ischemia. And would that be applicable to multiple injuries? Exactly, exactly. So multiple injuries and then massive uh, hemorrhagic shock, for example, that's what we showed also in humans in the so-called infrared trial, which was a trial in a ruptured aorta. 
So usually you don't even make it to the hospital. Those that make make it to the hospital have emergency aortic surgery, but there again, you cross clamp your aorta and then you do your surgery and then you open it up again. And there we saw if we get CD73 up, that survival was 100% because usually it's around 60%. So again, big impact in another very traumatic setting. Sure. And, and I guess it's not just military. I mean, it's horrible to talk about, but we see bombs and explosions in civilian situations as well. So it would be applicable in places like that too. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, car crashes, all kinds of major trauma. And is it something that is easy to administer? Like if somebody was in a car crash, would the ambulance crew be able to administer this? Yes, yes, thank you. Because it's just a single IV push. So an IV bolus, you just have to get that line to your vein and then it's good to go. All right. And so where are you at in terms of timelines? Well, that's the best question. Because the thing is that we've already been in human in some very difficult indications and again, it's shown good, but the indications we're talking are very difficult to run a controlled clinical trial in. And now we got this great primate data also, and the big internal discussion and also talking with our KOLs and people from the field, what's going to be the next clinical approach? Because running a trial in such a setting is extremely difficult. You could do, for example, all trauma or major trauma to the limb or a ruptured aorta, but it's always going to be very noisy because you've got what sort of the wound was, how bad was the trauma, how bad was the bleeding, what kind of surgery did they have. So there's a lot of stuff happening in these patients. So maintaining a controlled setting is actually extremely difficult. And to this respect, I believe we'll just have to go to the FDA, gather the current data and get some scientific advice on that. Now, there's actually are some examples that if there's no possibility of running a controlled clinical trial, you could get even approval with animal data. I guess the most recent communication from the company came out earlier today, I guess it was the one on Bexmerilimab. That's the cancer drug. So a completely novel immunotherapy targeting tumor-associated macrophages that actually showed that roughly 30% of, we did all comers in, this was the first in human trial, we did all comers, roughly 30% of patients uh, responded to treatment, they get a extension of life about three and a half fold, so a very significant impact on survival. And to me, the coolest thing about that, the population that benefits is the one that has a very cold tumor, because we talk about the cold tumor turning it hot. And where this drug has the benefit, especially the cold tumor type where there's no pre-existing inflammation ongoing, and we can spark that up, we can turn the cold tumor now hot, and we see this uh, impact in survival, which is very significant. Where are you on the timeline with this study? Yeah, so this was, again, the first in human last-line patients that have exhausted all resources. It's showing very good that we could, uh, and this was a single-agent study, that we could continue development there. But where we want to move the drug is the first line and in combinations with standard of care, where standard of care results have been poor. So, for example, and the PD-1 treatment in the head and neck cancer, lung cancer, where response rates are poor and where we know that they don't work in this cold tumor population. So we can give the extra benefit. We may be able to get anti pd ones work where they have not worked before with this new mode of action. All right. Is there anything else that you have in the pipeline? Well, then we have a preclinical asset called hematokine, which is for uh, hematopoietic stem cell expansion. We're currently running some mouse studies to see which molecule we would take into clinical trials. And that would be for chemotherapy-induced neutropenia. So every time you get chemo, so widely used still in cancer, you get depression of the bone marrow. And what our preclinical studies have shown by inhibiting the reactive Ochika species brought up by chemo, you can actually get hematopoietic stem cell recovery. And 
this is also has some anti-cancerous properties. So nowadays you usually use growth factors, for example, this condition, but now we can give an anti-cancerous drug because growth factors can also drive the cancer. Interesting stuff you're working on, definitely. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, again, playing with the immune system, where it needs some help, where it needs some tuning down, all that. For the audience, I would say stay tuned. Amazing stuff still to come. Next, we're going to get a preview of an upcoming event in Switzerland, and that's Biotech X. Joanna Magaji is the conference manager for the Biotech X event, and she has all the details for us. Um, it was formerly known as the Biodata World Congress and Genomics Live. But early this year, we decided to rebrand it to Biotech X. It's got the same great content, same, you know, great speakers, just with a new name and hopefully aiming to have about 2000 attendees this year. And you said it's the eighth year for this? Yes. All right. How has it changed over the years? Yes. So I guess in the beginning when the conference ran, this is when I wasn't around. It was quite a small meeting in Cambridge. But since then, we've moved to Switzerland. So the conference takes place there once a year in around early November. I think one of the greatest changes has been the numbers. So looking at like pre-COVID times, we had about 1,500 attendees. Then last year in 2021, we had 900 attendees. So obviously there was a drop, but considering the situation, it was still a good amount of speakers. So this year, obviously we're looking forward to welcoming about 2,000 attendees. And then another difference would be the scale. So this year we're hoping to have about 15 tracks running simultaneously, 17 tracks over the three days. So there are bit of changes throughout the days. We're hoping to keep the conference, well, the EU edition in Switzerland, just because of the bio hub that is there already. Roche, one of our um, largest pharmaceutical companies, have their HQ there. And it's really just so convenient for our attendees to get to as well. So yeah, we're looking forward to keeping it there in Switzerland. Could you tell me about your company a little bit? Because this isn't the only event that you do, is it? Yeah, sure. So um, the company I work for, Terrapin, we have lots of different events. So I guess in the life science um, industry, we have a conference called Vaccines, um, Drug Safety, Evidence Pricing and Access. Then if we look into like transport, we have an aviation conference, one on rail. So there are quite a number of conferences and a lot of different offices as well. So I'm just speaking for some of the conferences that you know, are produced by the London office, but with offices around the world, such as South Africa, Australia, the Middle East, there are loads of different conferences that take place. So Biotech X, can you tell me a little bit about the content? So what kind of event it is, whether it's just all presentations or exhibitions? Yeah. Yeah, so Biotech X covers a lot of different topics and um, we have 17 tracks all together and they all fall under either biotechnology or genomics or a mix of both. So some of the session titles include digital transformation, real world evidence. We also have data management, storage and architecture. And then from like the genomics side, um, we have, for example, single cell genomics and population genomics. And really how the different, should I say, brands um, differ is that the genomic tracks focus more on like the wet lab kind of sciences, whereas in the bio data side of the conference, it's a lot of like how the data that is produced by the wet lab scientists are stored and used in, you know, the real world. In terms of the content, if it's like presentations, we have a lot of presentations throughout the day. We also have panel sessions, which are great to encourage, you know, discussion. And then we also have exhibitors. So we have around 100 exhibitors this year. They'll be staying on site for all the three days. Um, and it's a great opportunity just to interact and see, you know, what products are being worked on. So, yeah, it's a mix of both, really. Who is it aimed at? Yeah, so a lot of the people that come to the conference are from large pharma so your Novartis, Roche, AstraZeneca then we have a lot of people from academia government groups and healthcare systems we also have a lot of people from biobanks so if you do fit in those kind of areas and obviously this conference is aimed for you also if you have an interest in biotechnology and how that's applied in the healthcare situation this conference would be suitable for you because you know you're learning about what people are working on currently what the current issues are and how they look to resolving those issues in the future. 
Can you give me all of the relevant details like dates, times? So this year's conference is taking place from the 8th to the 10th of November. It will take place in Congress Centre Basel. So that's based in Switzerland. So next year's dates have actually been released and that will be taking place from the 4th to the 6th of October. Same location, so Congress Centre Basel. Next, we're talking about an ingredient biotech startup, and that is Cultivated Biosciences, which recently received some funding. To tell us about the company is one of its co-founders, Thomas Turner. Cultivated is a food and biotech startup with a mission to create better products than factory farming. And we specifically work on solving the problem of texture in plant-based dairy. And we do so by working with special kinds of yeast that accumulate a lot of fat. And we extract this fat in a special process to get cream that we can that gives this nice, smooth mouthfeel that we know and love. Is that something that is an exact replication of the dairy product? Or is it like like a lot of dairy alternatives are kind of not made from milk? How does What's the basis of the product so it's not an exact replication we go to replicate macroscopic properties and also we work on microstructures that there are in milk and we create and we create from extracting the fat from yeast similar similar structures that then these can go and gives this mouthfeel that is gives the same texture experience as dairy Okay, so I guess it would qualify then as vegan? Yes. Is this to be used as in a product or is it for an ingredient in other products? What kind of... We are a B2B company. We are working with other companies. We have several letters of intent with clients that are very interested in using it to innovate and improve their products. So what kind of end products do you envisage this being useful for? more on the savory side looking at dips and sauces soft soft cheeses like cream cheese then we'll develop more to also hard cheeses and also confectionery uh, to go and serve in in more of this confectionery product that needs a nice mouthful and what about in terms of being able to produce at scale and produce as cheaply as the dairy industry yes so uh, our aim is to reach price parity with cream. So we are talking to CMOs and our goal is to uh, use also very similar infrastructure that is used to produce uh, baker's yeast today. That is one can use to produce yeast in bulk, in food grade uh, at large quantities. And we want aim at doing the same and producing a high added value product. Is this something that you'll be able to produce close to um, where it's needed on, a, on an easy basis? Because I know right now one of the biggest issues is having a huge plant and then having to transport products everywhere. Yes, we'll be able to to localize. Of course, economies of scales are important. One thing we'll do for sure is to have to at least centers for each big uh, geographic and economic area. Sure. And I guess you just got, well, recently got some funding. Could you tell me what that allows you to do? Absolutely. So we just we, we just announced our pre-seed fund, funding round of 1.4 million Swiss francs. Uh, this will allow us to advance and optimize our bioprocess to get our parameters to make it economically viable in terms of what we just discussed of reaching this price parity and then we'll also work with our clients to get this validation that we solve for the problems that they have a need for and to get this valid validation and so in the future uh, and for the next rounds we'll have de-risked all all these questions and so what kind of timelines are we looking at for this to be something that we're seeing in end products? Well, our aim is to 
the in the US second half of 2024, in Europe second half of 2025. This is due to novel food regulations that are much more slower in Europe than in the US. All right. How are you making out with the food regulations? Is that an easy process or no? No, it is quite a compli complicated one. We had special consultants to help us with the process. And well, in the US, it takes once you have done the safety studies and prepared the dossier from the time you submit to the time you receive, it's one year. In the EU, it's more than two years. Yeah, just to reiterate on this, I think I always do kind of a launch, a, a call for uh, working with regulators and hoping that as an industry, we can find better ways of uh, uh, launching our product in Europe, launching them still in a safe way and a way that ensures the safety of the, of the consumers, but that makes that European innovators can drive their innovations on European ground. I think that is something very important. And I imagine that it would have a massively smaller carbon footprint too. Yes, absolutely. So we have done the only initial life cycle assessments. So we don't have any precise data, but looking at the order of magnitudes, comparing to cream one to one, we are approximately 10 times more CO2 efficient. One news item that I found interesting recently was the potential for cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae, to maybe help out with the energy crisis. A group of researchers in Switzerland is using the photosynthetic bacteria to generate energy. While there's still a long way to go, and many questions to be answered, Artemis Bogosian at EPFL School of Basic Sciences in Switzerland can tell us more. And you will hear from her first in this interview, and you'll also hear from someone else working on the project, and that is Melania Regente. I guess uh, the first question is if you could tell me a little bit about the EPFL and what kind of work goes on there. Yeah, definitely. So the EPFL, so it stands for École Polytechnique Fédérale Lausanne. It's one of two federal Swiss institutes in Switzerland. So the German one, German speaking one is ETH and the French speaking one is EPFL. So we call them EPF Zurich and they call us ETH Lausanne. So it's just a translation. It's the same word. One is more uh, on the French speaking side and the other ones on the German speaking side. And so the federal institutions, uh, both of them focus on engineering and sciences. So in terms of what we do, it's really all of engineering and, and basic science areas. So they're all technical areas in our departments. So we don't have so much on the humanities sides, but we, there are more regional institutions that kind of work on the humanities. But we're involved in everything from fundamental basic science to implementation of engineering technologies. Moving on to your own work, could you tell me what the issues are when it comes to getting things into bacterial cells? If we compare with mammalian cells that use mechanisms like uh, endocytosis to get nanoparticles into their uh, outer membrane, bacteria doesn't have this, uh, this kind of mechanism. So the main uh, challenge that we faced basically was to get nanoparticles in the inside of bacteria. So getting this nanoparticle through the rigid uh, exterior of the cells, basically. And uh, indeed, uh, cyanobacteria are uh, surrounded by a rigid layer that is called peptidoglycan that uh, is made of polysaccharides. And uh, that this layer gives the structure and the shape to the cells, basically. And compared to other bacterial cells, in cyanobacteria specifically, is very thick and very packed. Is the cross-linking of this layer is uh, very high. And so getting nanoparticles inside this layer can be difficult. So this is, yes, the main challenge that we actually we faced, yes. And also because uh, beyond this layer, we, some of cyanobacteria also have an, an extra layer called S-layer that usually prevents the uptake of high molecular weight proteins. So our idea is, was to use these nanotubes decorated with specific proteins that may change the surface charge of the carbon nanotubes 
and can facilitate favor the penetration inside the rigid membrane of bacteria. All right. So could you tell me a little bit more about the nanotubes, what they are and what they're designed to do? So actually, our lab loves nanotubes. Uh, so we specifically love a, a type of nanotube called the single-walled carbon nanotube. And as the name implies, what single-walled carbon nanotube is just a single tube of carbon atoms. So you just imagine a tube, it could be, a, for example, a toilet paper tube, but just having a single layer of carbon. What's really neat about carbon nanotubes is there's a way to control the properties in a known matter. So these carbon nanotubes, they come in different diameters and the different diameters really change the properties. So you could change, for example, one diameter of nanotube could give you nanotubes that are conductive. So they have the same properties as metals. Another diameter of nanotubes make them uh, semiconducting. So semiconducting, so you know, people have had actually some experiences working with semiconductors, for example, solar cells. So unlike these metals, what semiconductors can do is they absorb light and they could re-harness it in another form. It could be, for example, light at a different wavelength, or it could also re-emit it as electricity. So what we really like about nanotubes is this ability to control the properties from being everything from a metal to a semiconductor just by changing the diameter of the nanotubes. And so the applications have been quite extensive. Mostly applications were related for imaging. So they put nanotubes inside of different cells and they could track the nanotubes inside of the cells by using, for example, semiconducting nanotubes. So they these nanotubes could absorb light and they re-emit light at lower energies. And what's nice about this light that it re-emits at lower energies is that the energies it re-emits are energies that our bodies do not naturally absorb. So for example, I could take a nanotube, implant it in my body, excite the nanotube, and then it emits a light. And because the body cannot reabsorb this light, we could start imaging the nanotube deep inside the body. So this has been really neat for applications. For example, if you want to do imaging deep inside, so brain imaging applications, so you could detect, for example, dopamine neurotransmitters. These are chemicals that are important for diagnostics of diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's also interesting for drug delivery applications. So you could put the nanotubes to, to deliver drugs inside of your body, for example, for cancer therapeutics. And because it emits this light that you could track deep inside of the body, you could track the location of the nanotube as it's delivering and releasing these drugs. There's been some applications where the nanotubes themselves have been used for photovoltaics, though the efficiencies are, are not as high as we see with other semiconducting materials. So really, this ability to control the interaction of this material with light just by changing the diameter of this material is something that's really fascinating and has a wide range of applications. And what's the relevance of being able to utilize cyanobacteria for the single wall carbon nanotubes? And how did you overcome the challenges that you faced with that? So as I previously said, we were able to show that when these uh, single wall carbon nanotubes are properly functionalized with positively charged protein, they are able to spontaneously uh, taken up by our bacteria. And the interesting part is what Artemis was actually saying, that they can preserve the optoelectronics properties even when they are internalized in, in, inside the cells. So uh, we have to imagine the light that they can emit, they are still clear and stable once they are internalized inside the bacterial cell wall. And this uh, emission, uh, the, the emission wavelength is uh, distinct from the autofluorescence from, of the cells itself, of, our, of the cyanobacteria. And this allowed us a range of wall cell application, also already mentioned by Ardemis. So what we did in our work is, was first to use this uh, emitted uh, signal from the carbon nanotubes to see really, to monitor the interaction, so to track the interaction between the carbon nanotubes inside the uh, cyanobacteria. This allowed us, since this signal is very stable and clear, this allowed us to monitor also uh, cell division and uh, we were tracking the doubling of the cells during uh, their growth. And uh, what we can envisage is also to use these uh, nanoparticles once they are internalized like an in-situ sensor in order to really see what is happening inside the bacterial cell. 
But then the interesting part that also we are focusing on is the application in the biophotovoltaics, because we observe that once they are internalized, and uh, once they are also the cells are illuminated by light, we can produce electricity that is enhanced compared to the electricity produced by wild type cells that doesn't have these uh, internalized carbon nanotubes. Could you explain a little bit about what inherited nanobionics is? So this is an observation from the cells that Melania mentioned that we're really excited about. So Melania, one of the critical points that she mentioned was when these nanotubes go inside of these cyanobacteria, the cyanobacteria give off this light, this near infrared that allows us to track the nanotubes. This light is completely unnatural. There's no protein. There's no natural substance that can give off this kind of light, this low energy light that the nanotubes give off. We were first excited that actually the bacteria were alive when we put the nanotubes inside them. We were even more excited when we found out that the bacteria was able to continue to reproduce and divide. And we were super excited when we found out that the daughter cells of these bacteria inherited this completely unnatural, these nanotubes, these unnatural properties. So this is really for the first time we're able to observe that we could give bacteria living organism capabilities that are completely unfounded in nature. And then they can, the daughter cells could inherit these unnatural capabilities. The analogy I've used commonly is giving somebody an artificial implant or artificial arm, artificial eye that that's beyond, you know, the capabilities of a natural organ, a natural eye, natural arm, and then having the daughter cells or the children inherit this capability. So this is the idea behind inherited nanobionics is giving organisms capabilities that you cannot find biologically and that you cannot even bioengineer, and then allowing the future generations to inherit this capability. This is kind of opens the doors to the new kinds of applications we can do. So we no longer just have to limit ourselves to biology or bioengineering, but we could impart completely artificial capabilities this way over several generations. It all sounds really exciting. And when you talk about the living photovoltaic device based on cyanobacteria, I mean, I think everybody kind of connects the dots because there's an energy crisis right now, climate crisis. How do you get from where you are to being able to do something about some of those issues? First of all, what we really found extremely fascinating regarding living photovoltaic is the possibility to harness solar cell while absorbing carbon dioxide, because it's basically solving two problems at once. Indeed, this technology is uh, contributed to a negative carbon footprint. How can we envisage in the future now the implementation? Because these are very self-replicating and abundant self-repairing microorganism, and these technologies rely on these microorganism. We have to think about that. We don't need complex facility to build up solar panels. So we are, in, compared to the fabrication, the disposal and the repairing of a conventional standard photovoltaic, we don't need to consume that much CO2 also. So the negative carbon footprint is also in this way in the fabrication process and disposal process too. And the idea that we have since they don't require so much nutrient, the nutrients that they need to survive are basically found in, in the atmospheric carbon, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus. We can envisage to have panels in uh, facade of buildings. Uh, we just have to ensure uh, humidity for the cells to survive. So we are uh, thinking something uh, like uh, panels that can uh, done by uh, hydrogel that can allow uh, the uh, cells to survive, but uh, still uh, allowing them to take up nutrients and having their the humidity to self-replicate. And what are some of the challenges or issues that might be associated with this, like cost or being able to do this at scale? The fact that, as I was mentioning, they are self-propagating and self-repairing system, there is a great interest for large-scale and long-term implementation. I can see that this is not really actually an issue. However, if we have to think about our system, the carbon-based biological photovoltaic system, we can see 
that one challenge for the scale up is uh, given by the at the moment uh, the production of the carbon nanotubes uh, if we relay this one always to the co2 consumption and absorption so at the moment what we are working on is uh, try to overcome this challenge in order to not offset the the advantage of the negative carbon food print going towards uh, more synthetic biology tools that can enable us to change the, meta the, the metabolism of the cells without using uh, exogenous nanoparticles like uh, carbon nanotubes. And so what are the next steps for your group and also to be able to move this towards commercialization? Is this something that you'll end up doing a spin-off from the facility or will it be sold for commercialization? How is that going to work? Yeah, so exactly as you mentioned, so our, our vision is actually to bring this to the market. And everything that Melania described is exactly the, the direction that we're heading towards bringing it. So just, you know, this is a material scientist dream that usually CO2 is released to make a material. Here's something that actually takes up CO2 and makes more of itself. And so the envision right now is so the, in terms of commercialization, we're aiming exactly as Melania said, is taking a bioengineering approach. So the main bottleneck is the carbon nanotubes. Uh, there's a big question mark. If we want to coat everybody's rooftops with this, what if we put nanotubes everywhere? What are the environmental implications? What are the effects on costs? So we use cyanobacteria that are cheap, but if the nanotubes bring up the cost, then that offsets the advantages of cyanobacteria. So in terms of bringing it to a market, we're looking at the next generation technologies where now that we know that the cyanobacteria can, we can extract reasonable electricity currents out of the cyanobacteria, can we bring down the cost and leave out the question of any environmental effects by using bioengineering? So the way we envision this is now we're trying to reprogram the DNA of the cyanobacteria so that we no longer need to add artificial nanoparticles, but the way it extracts or produces electricity is actually already programmed in its gene. So being a photovoltaic is naturally in its DNA. So these are cyanobacteria that are already genetically reprogrammed to produce electricity. And so the idea of bringing this to market is using these bioengineered cyanobacteria in the absence of adding any artificial nanoparticles. Once we have this cyanobacteria available, the idea, and we actually already, as a sneak peek as to upcoming publications from our lab, we, we may or may not already have this working, is basically just being able to commercialize this. So having uh, patented technologies that allow us to implement this at a larger scale in a cost-effective and in a green manner. And so what we're looking at is actually precisely, as you mentioned, spin-off companies. And right now our lab is bridging the gap between what we got to work in our lab and what we need to do for industry, which is kind of implementing this technology that we recently had gotten to work in a device that can be more scalable, that's more in line with current manufacturing techniques. It's a bit tricky because most bacterial technologies work on giant buckets of liquid bacteria. And here, our bacteria is going to be more on a solid-like substrate that you see on your rooftop. And so we're making that transition in our lab. And the idea is once we have this prototype ready, the commercialization will be much more natural. And obviously, you can't be exact, but what kind of timescales are you looking at for this? So in terms of prototype development, actually, you know, we're still applying for some grants now that we have this promising bioengineering aspect in the next five years. Uh, this is for prototype. In terms of actual startup technology, it depends actually on what we get of our prototype in terms of competitiveness. We still need to get our efficiencies up to be able to be competing against these photovoltaic technologies. But it also there's a political aspect, carbon tax. So things like the carbon tax, so although these PVs are very green, they actually emit a lot of CO2 just to make them. Implementation of these policies will certainly accelerate these technologies but in the absence of um, these kind of political policies, I would probably see in terms of being able to have these things on the market probably in the next 10 years. So I would say next five years to at least have a prototype and when we could start seeing some competitiveness, hopefully as the efficiencies continue to rise, something in the next 10 years is kind of the span that, that we envision at this point. You mentioned th something like putting them on a roof. What would they look like? Just like a traditional solar panel or? That's our dream right now, uh, because really all we know in terms of photovoltaics is what we already see, rooftops. It could be that as we're trying to look for implementation approaches, 
that some of the traditional architectures that are used for these synthetic photovoltaics will not work with cyanobacteria. I mean, in theory, everything should work on paper, but we don't know the challenges that we'll encounter unless we build this prototype. The state of the art we see is on the roof. We even have ideas for making this something kind of flexible. So a flexible gel kind of that you could put on the roof. But again, the design architecture, this is exactly the prototyping stage that we are at right now. The limitations that we see, the challenges will actually shape what the final design product will be. Right, that's it for this week. No commentary from Travis over at JLL this week because I think it's a busy time of year for everyone and sometimes schedules don't coincide. I know I'm about to enter a busy travel time and add to that the regular workload and it can get quite challenging. This weekend will also be challenging as we will be dog sitting, so the already loud decibel level in the house will just increase a little bit more. And when you add in more rain it might be a recipe for an interesting few days. So I had better go and make sure there's nothing within the reach of two energetic dogs and get back to the Bio Europe partnering tool. So I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast and that wherever in the world you are, you have a great week ahead and you'll join us next time for another Beyond Biotech. Biotech.